All right, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. Dear Father of the Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful night. And I thank you, Father God, that your presence is here right now. I thank you, Father God, that lives will forever be changed. I thank you, Lord, that everyone who leaves here tonight will not be the same. And Father God, that you may show up and you'll show out tonight, Father. And Father God, that you will speak through my lips. May you think through my thoughts. May you work through me, Father God. May that everyone in here, their eyes of understanding will be enlightened and the spirit of wisdom will be imparted unto them, Father God. And Father God, I'm asking you to grant me a spirit of boldness, Father God, to proclaim the things that you have warned me to proclaim tonight. And then, Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you said that you would never leave me nor forsake me. So, Father God, you're here with me right now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Man, I'm excited about tonight. Amen. So, I'm going to go ahead and give you the title of tonight's message. The title of tonight's message is Maintain the Glow. Maintain the Glow. And tonight we're going to talk about the fire of God. And I really believe that this is something everyone needs to wake up and pay attention to. Amen. It's time for the body of Christ to wake up. See, the body of Christ is like a sleeping giant right now. It needs to wake up and take its position. Amen. See, I'm reminded of a story when I was in, uh, during praise and worship about Brother Hagen told of this woman who was praying for this church. And she had a vision that Jesus Christ was on a horse riding through the church expecting the troops. And that's what he's doing right now. See, Jesus is looking for a vessel that he can use. See, Jesus can only do things through the earth through someone. So he needs you and I to be a willing vessel. He needs you and I to be prepared for him to use us. He's looking for someone who he can send revival to start at. See, I don't know about you, but I love to see and to go and watch the people in Mexico be on fire for God. It, it, I love it so much because when you get there, it's just nothing you see in the United States anymore. But you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of only experiencing it in other countries. It's time for the fire of God to start in Faith Family Church. So it's time to get off of Facebook during church. It's time to stop sleeping during church. It's time to stop playing games at church. It's time to stop coming to church just to fellowship. It's time to get serious. It's time to burn for God. See, there's a lot of people who come to church for different reasons. See, some people come to church just to fellowship. Some people come to church because they feel like it's a responsibility. But let me tell you something. Jesus, when he was preaching, he said, let all who hunger and thirst, let all who thirst come to me. Yes. And Mark Hankin said, he asked Jesus one time, he said, Jesus, why did you say that? And this is what, listen to what Jesus said. He said, because I only want to talk to the thirsty ones. Wow. So maybe if God's not talking to you here lately, it's because you're not thirsty. Yeah. Maybe if you haven't experienced things of God lately, it's because you're not on fire for God. So it's time to get thirsty. It's time to get on fire for God. Because I want to see revival break out in the United States. I want to see revival break out in South Carolina. I want to see revival break out in Chesterfield County. I want to see revival break out in Jefferson. I want to see revival break out in Faith Family Church. I want to see revival break out in the families of Faith Family Church. But it has to start with people who get on fire for God. You have to get on fire for God. It's also a commandment. An instruction that we have been given to be and maintain the glow. Romans 12.1 says, Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. One translation says, Maintain the glow. The Amplified Classic says, Be a glow, burning with a spirit, serving the Lord. Be a glow, burning with a spirit, serving the Lord. I love what the Passion Translation says, though. Romans 12, 11 in the Passion says, Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord. Amen. Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord. Amen. So when you come to church and you're greeting people, you shouldn't say, hey, nice to meet you. No, you should be happy. Amen. Be enthusiastic that you're serving the Lord. Amen. Don't, don't be upset when someone comes and asks you to serve in the kids' ministry. You be enthusiastic to serve the Lord. Keeping your passion toward him bowling hot. It's not saying lukewarm. It's not saying just kind of hot. It says keep it bowling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. Amen. Radiate with a glow. Now, we're going to open up tonight in 1 John 1.5. 1 John 1.5. 
It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. What you have to understand is that God never deals with darkness. From the foundation of the earth, God has hated darkness. God said, let there be light. And there was light. It's time to start speaking light into your life. It's time to get rid of all the darkness. God is light. Now, Matthew 5.14 And I'm going to try to slow down because I'm, woo, I'm ready. I have so many notes. We're not going to be able to get through all of them. But you know, I was listening to Brother Hagen yesterday talk about the glory of God. And I mean, he, I mean, he could was auction off stuff. I mean, he was talking so fast. And he said, oh, you think this is fast? We can go faster than this. And he kicked it up even a notch because he had to get it out. But I'm going to try to stay along so y'all can keep notes. But Matthew 5, 14, it says, ye are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You are the light of the world. So God has called all of us to be a light. But there are too many Christians who are not being a light. They are actually hiding their light. You are called to be a light. A light. And you may think, what is the point of revival? Well, let me tell you something about when revival starts, what happens. What happens is everybody gets healed, so there's no sickness. Everybody who came poor, they get blessed. People who are lost get saved. Revival literally fulfills what Jesus was called to do. What did Jesus say? He said, I am anointed to what? To preach the gospel to the poor. To set at liberty those who are captive. To heal the blind. He, revival literally fulfills what God wants to do in the earth. And what? Quickly, though. That's the whole point of it. Quickly. And I don't know if you know it or not, but Jesus is coming back very quickly. Yes. Coming back very quickly. Every day we're starting to see more and more things that has to happen before his coming. So, I don't want to be responsible for other people going to hell who I could have rescued. I don't want to be held responsible for that. When I get to heaven, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. But if you are not being a light, you'll never hear it. If you are not being a light, you'll never hear it. Well, what is a light? Let's go to Hebrews 12, 29. Hebrews 12, 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. And this is the passage I want you, if you leave anywhere, if you, go, if you don't get anything out of this message, I want you to leave here knowing that our God is a consuming fire. Now, everyone knows that if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, so if you're born again, that means that Jesus is living on the inside of you. We all know that, okay? Well, here, if God is a consuming fire, then that means there's a fire living on the inside of you. It is said that a naked eye can see a tiny candle flame from 30 miles away in the darkness. So people should be able to see us and see our fire in darkness. But yet, so many of us, people can't see the fire inside of us because we have let our fire go out or we're hiding the flame. But I'm here tonight to tell you that it's time to burn brighter than ever before. It's time to experience things that you've never experienced before. If you have let your light go out, then it's time to re rekindle the flame. It's time to burn again for God. 2 Timothy 1.6, an M5 classic. 2 Timothy 1.6, M5 classic. It says, that is why I would remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers of, fan the flame of, and keep burning. One more time. Rekindle the embers of, fan the flame of, keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you, by means of the laying of my hands of who those elders at your ordination. Hallelujah. You got to keep that fire burning. You got to keep the fire of God burning inside of you. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, a fire was put inside of you. Amen. But the problem is, is a lot of us, we didn't do anything to the fire. We didn't rekindle the flame. We didn't put gas to the fire. We let it dwindle and get out. So now when we go out into the darkness, the darkness sees darkness because there's no light. But when you go out into the darkness, it should, see, it should be like a city upon a hill. They should be able to recognize that there is something different about you. 
Too many Christians are living on pilot flame mode. Too many Christians are living on the pilot flame. Barely turning the flame on. I'm here to tell you, there's no power in that. There's only this much. You're barely getting by. But God wants you to crank it all the way up. But here's the question. A lot of us ask, well, why should I burn for him? What is the importance of fire? Well, there's a couple of reasons. We see the first answer and the main answer, the main answer in Matthew 5, 16. The main answer is in Matthew 5, 16, right here. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. And here's, here's the answer right here. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the whole point of being a light is so that others will glorify God. That's the whole point. So this is what you need to know. And bold, highlight, whatever. Fire never points towards yourself, but always points to the Father. Fire will never point towards yourself. Fire was literally given so that it would glorify God, point to Him. So this is what it tells me, is that if, things in, if you're doing things that point to yourself, then you're not glorify God, which also means you're not on fire for God. Because whatever you do when on your own fire will always glorify God. When someone is on fire for God, it's so others will know that God is the only one who can save them. It is to let others know that God is powerful, God is just, God is almighty. That's the importance of fire. That's the main reason. There's other importances of fire. Number one, and I don't know if you know this or not about me yet, and you're pretty sure you figured it out, but I like points. <laughs> Big point guy. I like ABC, one, two, three. Okay? So number one, the importance of fire. Fire represents God's presence, but also his power. Fire represents power. So since fire represents power, then if you have fire on the inside of you, that means there's a power inside of you. That means that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells inside of you. That means there's a flame, there's a power, there's a spirit on the inside of you that can raise somebody from the dead, that can raise any situation that seemed dead alive again. Number two, the Holy Spirit is many times represented by fire. In Matthew 3.11 it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire and the Holy Ghost are like this. They go hand to hand. Because we also see this in Acts 2 verses 3 through 4. In Acts 2, verses 3 through 4, and it says, And there appeared to them cloven tongues of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So where the fire was, there was the Holy Spirit moving. So, if there's no fire inside of you, the Holy Spirit's not working on the inside of you. You've got to rekindle the flame. You've got to get back to it. You've got to be that light again. It's time to wake up. Number three, the glory of God and the fire of God go hand to hand. The glory and the fire of God go hand to hand. And we see this in Exodus 13, 21. And Miss Marilyn, you are doing a fantastic job. <laughs> Exodus 13, 21 says... And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and by night. A lot of times the glory of God is described as a cloud. Many times when Brother Hagin was preaching, he would see the glory cloud start rolling in. The glory is represented by a cloud. In the Zeus Sheet Revival, a cloud of glory would come down and sit on the congregation to nobody could stand up. That's the glory. The glory is represented by a cloud, kabod, heavy. But fire goes hand to hand. God moved in glory and fire. So there's importance to that. 
Now, the second main reason of fire. The fire of God purifies. The fire of God purifies. Whew. So let's go back to Hebrews 12, 29. Mm. It says, for our God is a consuming fire. Now I want to give you this definition of purification right here. Listen very closely. Purification is the process of physically isolating, separating, or removing foreign or contaminating substances from a compound. Essentially, here, check this out. Purification of a compound refers to increasing its quality by eliminating impurities. Increasing its quality by eliminating impurities. So that means that those who are on fire for God, they're increasing their quality in the spirit realm. Why? Because they're getting rid of all their impurities. Now, what you must understand about the purification process is that fire must get extremely hot to purify. See, a pilot flame, that little tiny thing, it's not going to purify anything. See, when you got saved, that little flame was put inside of you. But yet, those old habits, the way of thinking, is still there. You're a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. But yet, that way of thinking had to be changed. Why? Because you haven't got that flame big enough to purify yourself yet. Check this out. Science tells us that the average deep red fire flame is anywhere from 1,112 degrees to 1,800 degrees. 1,800 degrees is the average red deep flame. But yet, still not hot enough. Still not hot enough to completely purify something. An orange-yellow fire can be anywhere between 1,900 degrees which is the temperature that gold purifies at, 1900, to 2,012 degrees. An orange yellow fire can be anywhere between 1,900 degrees to 2,012 degrees. Now, remember that. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2.21. 2 Timothy 2.21. <laughs> it says, Therefore, as anyone cleanses himself from these things which are dishonorable, disobedient, sinful, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart for a special purpose, and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Amen. Now, Noah's Webster's Dictionary of 1828, remember Hebrews 12, 29, it says our God is a consuming fire. Noah's Webster's Dictionary of 1828 defines the word consuming as this. Burning, destroying, expending, Eating, devouring. Burning, destroying, expending, eating, devouring. So God wants the fire of God to get so hot that on inside of you that it will burn, destroy, eat, and devour everything that's inside of you that is not of Him. He wants to burn it out of you so you will be ready to be used. Because if you are never go through that purification process, if you never let that fire get so hot that it burns, eats, destroys everything that is not of God inside of you, you will never be used for a special purpose. You'll just be living an ordinary life. But the moment you let that fire get so big on the inside of you that it f burns every impurity out of you, then you are ready for a special purpose. You are ready to be used for, by the master. Amen. That's when you'll hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. See, that's the exact reason David said in Psalms 139, 23 through 24, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Because David wanted everything that was not of God to be burned out of him. Because David wanted to be used by God. So if you are not on fire for God, you can never fulfill all that God has for you. You can never be used for a special purpose because you will always have impurities that will not be burned out. You will have things that try to hold you back and stop you if you not burn them off. 
There is a reason Moses had to the encounter, had an encounter with the fire before he could fulfill his complete purpose. There's a reason. Moses had to see that bush on fire before he could ever go lead those people out and do them exactly what God had called him to do. He had to have an encounter with the fire. Because when you encounter the fire, you can't be still anymore. The fire will cause you to go out. It's just like in the natural. If you get on fire, you're not going to be like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> just walking around. No, you get on fire, you're going to stop, drop, and roll. You're going to take off running. You're going to jump up and down. That's the way it is with God. And we see it in, we see it in the surface. There'll be times where it gets so hot that you can't sit still anymore. You jump up, you run, you shout, you praise God. Why? Because there's a fire burning on the inside of you. You can't be still anymore. So if you're stuck in your spiritual life right now and you're not going up, that means because you're not on fire for God. But the moment you get on fire for God, it will push you up. It will make you run. It will make you jump. It will take you off and get on the purpose of God. The moment you get on fire. But anytime you're just on pilot mode, you can stay the same. Smith, Smith Wigglesworth said this. You must every day, how many times a week? Every day. every day, make higher ground. You must every day make higher ground. You must deny yourself to make progress with God. <laughs> you must deny yourself to make progress with God. You must refuse everything that is not pure and holy. Must refuse it. You must make higher ground. God wants you to be pure in heart. He wants you to have an intense desire after holiness. Whew. Two things will get you to leap out of yourself into the promise of God today. Here they are. There's two things that Smith Wigglesworth said that would get you to leap out of yourselves into the promises of God. Here they are. Number one, purity. And the other is faith. But faith is kindled more by purity. Faith is kindled more by purity. If you want your faith to get stronger, become more pure. Go through the purification process. Get on fire for God. Burn everything out. And when you start burning for God, your faith will get so strong, stronger than it's ever been before. So to make higher ground, you must be pure. To be pure, you must go through the purification process, which is by fire. So we discovered that an orange-yellow flame is from anywhere between 1,900 degrees to 2,012 degrees. Okay? But there is an even hotter flame. There is a white flame that produces a very bright glow that is hotter than both of the other flames. Its temperature is anywhere from 2,400 degrees to 2,700 degrees. So not only does Jesus want you to get so hot that it purifies everything on the inside of you, but then he wants you to take it to another level. He wants you to get even hotter for him to the point where you just glow with his radiance. See, this is the type of glow when you are walking in your full identity and power. This is the type of glow when you know exactly who you are in Christ. And the, what's been given to you. And what Jesus has done for you. Amen. When you start to meditate on that, that fire will burn brighter to the point you walk in the white flame. Woo. See, in Acts 5.15, Acts we see the white flame. It says, Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that the least of the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. The Passion Translation says this, in fact, when people knew Peter was going to walk by, they carried the sick out to the streets and they laid them down on cots and mats, knowing the incredible power emanating from him would overshadow them and heal them. Peter was burning so bright for God that it was illuminating out of him. That's the white flame. That's where God wants every one of his children to walk in. 
So you need to even, you, you should be so far gone from that little tiny flame to a point where fire illuminates out of you. To the point where people get under your shadow, they're healed. But how did people know that under the shadow they would be healed? Well, I believe for two things. First, they already seen miracles. But second, they could see the fire of God on Peter. They could see it. They could see the power. They could tell something was different about this man. See, the same thing happened to Moses. The people could see the glory of God on him. In Exodus 33, 18, and this should be your prayer every day. I've been going back and listening to Pastor, Zadie, uh, Pastor Eddie's message back in June, I believe, about the glory of God. And this should be the Faith Family Church cry. I beseech you, therefore, God, show me thy glory. Yes. Now let's go to the next chapter in Exodus thirty-four twenty-nine. Moses had been in the glory of God on Mount Sinai. It says, And when he came down from the mount, that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. Then five classes says his face shone with a unique radiance. This is the type of fire and the power of God God wants all his children to walk in. And another quick place we'll have to turn there that we see this bright light is when uh, Paul had an encounter in Damascus in Acts 9.3. It says, And the light of God shone around him to a point it blinded him. That's bright. That's bright. That's not a little flame. Amen. Listen to what Smith, Smith Wigglesworth said again. This is what he said. God never intended for his people to be ordinary or commonplace. That's right. So if you're living an ordinary Christian life, God never intended that. If you're common, God never intended that. God wants you to be Extraordinary. His intentions were that they should be on fire for him, conscious of his divine power, realizing the glory of the cross that foreshadows the crown. Ooh. God, Smith Wigglesworth said that God's intentions were that everyone would be on fire for him. So there's two things that we can take away from this. <laughs> Number one, and we've been talking about this, there are different levels to this fire. There's different levels. Just how there's different heats and different levels of heats and temperatures and different colors of fire, there are different levels of fire in our spiritual lives. There is a flame, and then there might be a bonfire. Then there is a conflagration. C-O-N-F-L-A-G-R-A-T-I-O-N. Which means a very intense, uncontrolled fire. It's basically what a wildfire turns into, something that cannot be tamed. So you can start out with a flame. You might work your way out with God. You might be a bonfire. But then you might get to a point where that's the conflagration. Conflagration. Which is that white flame. Amen. Number two. To get the fire, you must want the fire. See, Moses said, show me your glory. The glow of Moses didn't happen by accident. The glow of Moses happened because he seeked the glow. He wanted the glow. So in order to have the glow, you must want the glow. So why do people not want the fire? See, if we see all these things and we talk about how the fire is powerful and the fire stands out in darkness and people are attracted to the fire, but why do we not want that? Because if you tell me that you want it, but then you're not living your life in such a way that exemplifies that you want it, then you're a liar. Because actions always speak louder than words. So why do, you actually, why do some people actually not want the fire? Very simple. Number one, being uncomfortable. Number one, being uncomfortable. Because I'm here to tell you the fire of God is uncomfortable. Whoa, whoa. Fire of God's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's not pleasant because you're going to discover why right here. Just like a natural fire, the closer you get to the fire, the more uncomfortable it gets. You imagine you're at a bonfire. From over here, your hands might feel nice and warm, might feel good. But every step closer you get to the fire, the hotter it gets, 
the more uncomfortable you start to feel. The closer you get, the more uncomfortable you start to feel. That's why people will never get that white flame, because they are scared of being uncomfortable. They're living on their comfort zone. But what have we been taught our whole, since we've been coming to church here? Your breakthrough is on the edge of your comfort zone. You got to push back, push past that uncomfortability. You got to keep pushing. Keep pushing. You got to be willing to be uncomfortable for God. See, the fire of God is uncomfortable because it requires sacrifice. That's exactly why it's uncomfortable. It requires something from you. It requ requires sacrificing your wants. It requires sacrificing your time. It requires sacrificing your will and taking on God's will. It requires you to sacrifice yourself. See, Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So sacrifice is uncomfortable. And what you must realize is the closer you want to get to the fire, the more you will have to sacrifice. Amen. If you want to get to that white flame, then you have to sacrifice what it takes to get to that white flame. Which means reading your Bible for two minutes a day is not cutting it. Right. Reading your Bible for five minutes a day is not cutting it. Right. Brother Milton talked about it Sunday. You'll be surprised if you took notes about how long you spend your time at a day. Because let me tell you something. If you're spending time on Instagram or Facebook for an hour but only reading your Bible five minutes, you'll be ordinary. If you're watching TV at night longer than you've read your Bible that day, you'll be ordinary. If you only talk to God in the morning, you'll be ordinary. See, if you want this white flame, you have to meditate day and night. Meditate day and night on the fire. Meditate about how, what you can do to expand that fire on the inside of you. You got to sacrifice something. And you can always tell when there's been sacrifice. By praise and worship. And you may think, oh, here he goes again, talking about praise and worship. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When there's been sacrifices throughout the week, when praise and worship first starts, the presence of God's immediately there. But the problem is we don't sacrifice anything through the week. We only sacrifice on Sundays and Wednesday nights. We only sacrifice our time during that time. But if you would stay ready and prepare and sacrifice your time throughout the week, then we can get further in the glory of God. We can go from glory to glory. But until we start sacrificing, we'll always be at glory and never go to glory. That's why the Amplified Bible says to present your bodies dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice. Number two, why people don't want the fire. Oh, I'm about to pull a Brother Hagen here. See the time. <laughs> Number two is fear. A lot of people fear what others think about them, so they don't want to be on fire because they're scared someone might think they are weird. But you shouldn't want to look or act like the world. You should be separated from the world. 1 Peter 1.15 says, and Amplified, 1 Peter 1.15 says, Be like the Holy One who has called you. Be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Be set apart from the world by your godly character and moral courage. As believers, we shouldn't care what the world thinks about us. We should be set apart. Amen. See, I was talking to Pastor Eddie about this topic, and he brought up the scripture in 1 Kings 18.24 where it says, Elijah said, The God who answers by fire, let him be God. So our God is a God who answers by fire. Because we can see in the story that the fire fell from heaven and consumed. Notice what the word it uses. It says it consumed the water. Which means it took over everything. There wasn't a single drop of water anymore. Now, well a couple of days later I was riding down the road and I was meditating on that scripture. The God who answers by fire is God. And all of a sudden 2 Corinthians 5.20 popped up in my spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. To be an ambassador means to represent. So as Christians, we are supposed to represent Christ. The word Christian literally means being like Christ or Christ-like. So as Christians, we are supposed to act like Christ. We are supposed to speak like Christ. Well, meditating on this, all of a sudden I heard this question. As Christians, how many times do you answer by fire? 
Think about that for a minute. As Christians, how many times do you answer by fire? See, if God answers by fire, then we are supposed to answer like by fire. Well, then I asked God, I said, God, where is the example of answering by fire? And he pointed me to Acts 3. And we're going to read Acts 3, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read it real fast. It says, Now Peter and John went up together in the temple at the hour of praying, being the ninth hour. Verse 2. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that enter the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked, and, all. and, and verse 4. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, and John said, Look on us. But verse 5 right here. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something of them. In verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have given thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, wise up and walk. Rise up and walk. That's answering by fire. He said this is a demonstration of answering by fire. See, too many Christians read the scripture where it says to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But when they see someone sick or hurting or needing prayer of any kind, we try to give them something physical like medicine or money instead of answering by fire. But if you answer by fire, this is how this conversation would go. Can I lay hands on you? Because when I lay hands on you, you shall recover. You shall rise up and walk. Many people act like this is just for preachers. Only Brother Pastor Eddie or Pastor Milton or Pastor Josh can lay hands on people. No. Mark 16, 17 through 18. And he said that these signs shall follow them that believe. Who? Those who believe. How do you become a Christian? Believing. Believing that God died for your sins. Confessing it with your mouth. Believing. So if you believe in God, then these signs should follow you too. That means that it's your responsibility to answer by fire. Fire spreads quickly. When people see the fire of God and, you, and they answer by fire, they will be attracted to it. People will be attracted to the fire. So parents, stop trying to get your kids on fire when you are not. Stop trying to get your kids on fire when you're not. Instead, you get on fire and they'll be attracted to it. Till they catch the fire on themselves for God. See, if your child's not on fire for God, that's maybe because they've never been around fire. But the moment you get on fire for God, instead of trying to push fire on them, and they get around that fire, you play around fire and long enough you'll fall in. So instead of tell, letting your children do whatever they want, get them in the house of God. Where the fire's at. So they'll fall in. But not only that, they should be experiencing the fire at home. So stop trying to send them to youth camp so they'll get on fire for God. They should go to youth camp on fire for God. We can believe that Faith Family Church will catch on fire and that our families will catch on fire. But what you must realize is that fire starts within. Fire doesn't start outside and move in. Fire starts within and then spreads out. See, a house all of a sudden doesn't catch on fire. Boom! No, what happens is a fire starts in a room. And then it spreads throughout the whole house until the whole house is on fire. See, that's how it is with your family. You start on fire, and boom, the whole house will get on fire. You want Faith Family Church to start on, get on fire? Boom, you start on fire and let it spread throughout the congregation. Hallelujah. Now we got to move real quickly through these. Things that put the fire of God out. Number one, sin. But also being around sin. We don't talk about that enough. We're about to get into it. Isaiah 59, 2 in the NLT says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. It's not your dad's sins. It's not your mom's sins. It's not your brother's sins. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen to you anymore. So sin cuts you off from God. Well, if God is fire, then sin will literally cut you off or remove, remove you from the fire. But hanging around sin is just as bad. Fire is supposed to stand out. But how do you stand out if you are with them or hanging around them? 
There is a difference between loving somebody and condoning their sin by hanging around it. Especially hanging around sin that God destroyed a whole city for. There's a difference. Every time the fire gets a little bigger, hanging around sin is like a wet blanket. It smacks the fire and keeps it down. Proverbs 22.1 in the Passion says, A beautiful reputation is more to be desired than great riches. And to be esteemed by others is more honorable than to own immense investments. When you hang around sin, what kind of reputation are you creating? People will say, well, so-and-so says he's a Christian, but he hangs around those people. So they begin to think that those things are okay for a Christian to do. But not only that, Psalms 1-1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Some translations say, or join those who have no use for God. Stop hanging around people who have no use for God. Number two, things that put the fire of God out. Pride. Pride is an instant fire killer. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. We know this is exactly what happened to Satan. He thought that he should be lifted up. He should be higher. He should be worshipped. But he fell, he fell because of it. This is exactly what would happen to those who are being full of pride. Those who think they need a position. Those who think that they are supposed to be praised or recognized because what they have done or what they could do. <laughs> These people will fall. Why? Because fire never points to self, but always to him. So stop thinking you need a position. Another example of pride is, I already know that attitude. A lot of Christians come to church, and when the pastor begins to preach on a subject that he preaches on a lot or begins to tell a story that he tells a lot, they go, I have already heard that, or I already know that. What they're actually saying is that I'm already perfect in that area. Or they begin to look around at people who they think should be hearing this. That's pride. You'll fall. The moment you hear something and you begin to look around, I hope so-and-so is here to hear this. I hope so-and-so hears this because they need to work on this area. That's pride. You're going to fall. But instead, humility will say, how can I work on this? How can I better myself in this area? Number three, satisfaction. Notice I didn't say contentment. Dad preached a great message on contentment. But there's a difference between contentment and satisfaction in your walk with God. What I'm talking about is a Christian when they view their walk with God as a checklist. They act like because they have done this already that they can check it off their list. They act like because they laid hands on someone or they cast a demon out of someone a long time ago that they shouldn't or don't have to do that anymore. And that's why you hear many Christians say, they did this a long time ago instead of, I did this yesterday. That's why too many Christians are talking about what they did in the past instead of what they're talking about doing now or yesterday. Because they view things as a checklist. Oh, this woman, I cast a demon out of her. I laid hands on her. Okay? How many more times have you done that? Or if you checked it off your list so you act like you don't have to do that anymore. You lay hands on somebody and they recovered one time, but now because you do that, now you just walk past people who need the hands laid on. Why? Because you checked it off a list. You're satisfied with your spiritual walk. But I'm going to tell you something about a fire. A fire is never satisfied. That's why Paul said in Philippians 3, 10 through 12, in verse 10 he said that he wanted to know God more. A man who had been called up to the third heaven, a man who had divine revelation from God himself, he said that I want to know God more. In verse 12 he tells us that he wasn't even done yet. He even attained it yet. Paul could have easily been satisfied with what he had already done. But instead, Paul said that I may know him more. Because Paul had a fire burning on the inside of him that he knew that no matter where he was at in his spiritual walk, there was always more territory to gain. Because he knew every day you should be gaining territory. Paul didn't want to be satisfied or put to sleep by, be, by being satisfied with what he had done already. See, the devil has used satisfaction to put Christians to sleep. 
He slowly just rocks them to that flame. It goes back to a pilot because they're satisfied with what they've done already. They're satisfied that one time they gave $10,000. Mm. Number four, getting out of the love walk. What you have to realize is that everything in the Bible is based off of love. Think about it. John 3, 16 says, For God so what? Loved the world. The Bible says that faith worketh by love. That's right. It also says that out of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Yeah. The fire of God is started by love. That's how it starts. Love. How do you, how do you start, well, how do I start the fire of God? Love. It started by wanting what God wants. The fire of God is started by getting closer to God because you want to get as close as you possibly can and to know him as much as you can. That's how the fire started. The fire is started by getting back to your first love. The Bible says God is love. So when you get out of love, you get out of the fire. Now, fire starters. Number one, love. We've already talked about that. Number two, unity. Psalms 133 verse 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now let's go to Acts 2 verses 1 through 3. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all in one accord in one place, and there appeared to them cloven tongues like a fire that sat upon each of them. Notice that the fire of God fell when they are in one accord, when they are in unity. God loves unity. God doesn't love when you come and gossip about someone else in the church. God doesn't come when you come and judge what songs we pick to do on Sunday. God doesn't love it when you come to church and think there should be a different message that's been preached. God loves unity. God loves people who will hook up to the vision. And when people hook up to the vision, when they get in one accord, that's when things start to be done. That's when the fire of God falls in unity. Number three, things that the by st fire starters, number three, being a doer of the word. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. This doesn't mean to nod your head and say amen when the pastor says something, but then not apply it. Too many Christians sit in church, and they go, amen, that's right, hallelujah, glory to God, but then they don't apply it. You know what that amen, that nod, and all that was? Useless. <laughs> Completely useless. If you're going to say amen, then you hold yourself accountable to apply the word, to be a doer of the word. <laughs> this doesn't mean that you're only a doer of the word at church. A lot of Christians speak the, speak the word at church, but when they get home, they don't. A lot of people act like they're holy at church, but when they get home, they fight with their kids. They can't control their kids. A lot of people, when they, act, when they get to church, like they love God, but when they get back home, they say a four-letter word. A lot of people act like they love God, but when they get out with their friends, they'll take a sip. A lot of people act like they love God, but when they get out, they'll smoke this, they'll smoke that, they'll snort that. If you love God, then you're on fire for God. Then you do the word of God. Because John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So when you love God, then you apply the word. You're in the word. The word is fire. God is fire. Be a doer of the word. The word of God is fuel to the fire inside of you. Fire craves fuel to grow. And the bigger the fire is, the more fuel it takes to grow. So when you're on fire, you crave the word. You crave more of the word as the fire grows inside of you. And we're going to start closing up right here. Number four, things that start fire. Prayer. We should always be praying for revival in the fire of God. Let's look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. And a lot of us know this verse. It says, If my people humble themselves, not proud, and what? And pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. Amen. If you want God to heal your land, pray. But let's go back to verse 1 and verse 3. Verse 1 says, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. Notice the fire came down when Solomon finished praying. And consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. So the glory and the fire came because Solomon prayed. Now let's go to verse 3. 
Verse 3 says, And when all the children of Israel say how the fire came down, when they saw how the fire came down, the glory of the Lord was upon the house. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good and his mercy endure forever. Notice the fire, and Caitlin, y'all could come on and go up. Notice the fire fell after he finished praying. So if you want people to fall down, if you want people to proclaim the goodness of God, then you must pray. It started from prayer. So if we want people to bow down and proclaim the goodness and the mercy of God, they must see the fire. Because notice, it says when they saw the fire, they bowed down and worshipped. People are not going to bow down and worship God and proclaim His goodness and His mercy if they can't see a fire inside of you. Because if there's no fire inside of you and you're trying to proclaim this, you're a hypocrite. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The fire of God will burn out every sickness, anything that's been holding you in bondage, it will burn it out. So if you need prayer tonight, and you, and let me tell you something else. You can't light someone else's fire until yours is lit first. It's like a torch in a cave. Until your torch is on fire, you can never light someone else's torch. So if you want the fire to be started in your life tonight, then come on up. Quickly. Quickly. Because I'm telling you, when the fire of God hits you, a flame, a power like never before, people will begin to see things like they've never experienced before. Father God, Father of God, I'm asking you for the fire of God to fall at this altar, Father. May it burn everything out of everyone's life who is not, that's not of you, Father God. May purification happen. May a power be put inside of them, Father God. And knowing my hand, Father God, I need some Jesus. Fire of God, burn away inside of you in the name of Jesus. Burn with the fire of God. people don't want the fires because they fear they fear people oh people think I'm already a holy Christian let me tell you something there's levels to this there's levels to this so don't act like because someone saw you praising God that you can't come down here if you want the fire of God to grow more and more and more then you have to rekindle the flame in the name of Jesus burn
We magnify you. We thank you, Father God. Oh, Lord, I thank you. The fire is burning brighter and brighter and brighter, hotter and hotter in our hearts tonight, Father God. My Lord, you're wonderful. I praise you, Father God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I believe what the Lord has told us tonight, one of the things that no matter, no matter how hot you may believe you are for, for God, you can always get hotter. I remember Smith Wigglesworth telling the pastor as he walked down the stairs, he spent the night in the pastor's home. He stopped about halfway to, and he saw the pastor and he said, God spoke to me. He said, what did he say? He said, he said, he's going to burn everything out of you that's not of him. Hallelujah. Our cry should be, Lord, I'm asking you to burn everything contrary to your will, contrary to your nature out of me. Hallelujah. Lord, we must decrease so that you may increase in our lives that people will see Christ in us. May no one, Lord, be afraid of the fire because even though we know you are a consuming fire, like the bush that Moses saw, you only consume that which is not of you, that which is not pleasing to you. And I, oh Lord, tonight, I pray, Father God, that this will be the beginning of a great revival fire. Like a forest fire that starts with a small ember and spreads and begins to rage and consumes thousands of acres. I pray, Father God, that the fire of the Holy Ghost will burn so bright as we leave here tonight that people will see that fire. Not only on this house, but on our houses, our homes, our lives. For these bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. I praise you, Lord. We worship you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. What a powerful word. Take it with you tonight. Don't let it go out. Hallelujah. Go home and put some wood on it. <laughs> Amen. Go home and pour some gas on it. Let it get bigger and brighter and brighter and brighter. And brighter. Somebody give the Lord a shout before we leave the place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 